Good afternoon. Would you please stand for the presentation of the callers and our Pledge of Allegiance. Students, staff, honored veterans, members of the Hamilton community. Today gives us the opportunity to celebrate and honor the bravery and sacrifice of all United States veterans. Today was once known as Armistice Day, a holiday to recognize the end of the Great War, known as the First World War which take, took place 100 years ago yesterday on the 11th day of the 11th month at the 11th hour. In 1938, 80 years ago this year, November 11th was dedicated to the cause of world peace and celebrated as Armistice Day, honoring World War I veterans. In 1954, after both World War II and the Korean War, the U.S. Congress amended the Act of 1938 by changing the word armistice to the word veterans. And on June 1st, 1954, November 11th became a day to honor American veterans of all wars. One of the things that um, happens when you're an old fart like me and Mr. Herzog and been around in the district for a long time, you get to a point where you're teaching the, uh, the kids of kids that you taught earlier in your career. And so this is a sort of interesting treat for me because our first speaker was one of my first students actually back in 1995. So I've known Randy for quite a long time, and his son Peyton, I don't know, Peyton, where are you? Stand up, you should be down. Get down here. Get down here and sit next to your father. Randy, Randy graduated from Hamilton High in 2001, 
very fateful year in our history, of course. And he was in the Marine Corps, is in the Marine Corps, which just celebrated its anniversary a couple of days ago. Hoorah, Semper Fi. And was the invasion of Iraq in 2003 and at Fallujah in 2005 and 2006. He was in the infantry and helped start the Marine Corps Mortuary Affairs Program. He signed up to do infantry and was one of approximately 30 Marines to be chosen by the Marine Corps to do mortuary affairs for the first time as a unit in the history of the Marine Corps. His job was to collect the bodies of our fallen soldiers off the battlefield and process the remains and return them to their families. His awards include the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal, Combat Action Ribbon, two Armed Force Reserve Medals with mobilization devices, Selective Marine Corps Reserve Medal, Global War on Terrorism Expeditionary Medal, Global War on Terrorism Service Medal, two Sea Service Deployment Ribbons, National Defense Medal, Presidential Unit Citation, Marine Unit Citation. It's great pleasure that I can introduce one of my former students who did good for his country, Randy Aragon. How are you guys doing? All right. So, like Mr. Marcello had said already, uh, I was in the Marine Corps. I graduated from Hamilton High in 2001. Um, before I graduated, I knew that I really didn't want to go to college and do the traditional type of thing, so I begged and I pleaded with my family and my mom to help me enlist into the Marine Corps when I was 17. Um, they were all against it. Nobody wanted me to do it, but I had my mind made up. So. I convinced my mom to sign me up since I was only 17 by telling her I would go in as a reservist and I would make sure to go to college at the same time. I also lied to her. I told her that if a war did break out, it was peacetime at the time, so I said if a war did break out, I was a reservist. I wouldn't have to go to war. Uh, I knew that wasn't true, but she didn't know, and what she don't know won't hurt her, right? Uh, so. Fast forward a couple months from the day I got I enlisted, and 9-11 happened. So I didn't even get to boot camp before my lie came out. Um, I had graduated and got a full-time job that, that summer, and I was there waiting to go to boot camp at my job when 9-11 happened. Uh, we were sitting there watching TVs as uh, we saw the planes hit the towers, planes hit the Pentagon, and uh, it was at that moment that I had the realization that we were getting ready to go to war because we as Americans would never let something like that happen to us without fighting back. Um, so I left for Paris Island uh, two months later in November. And uh, from there, I went to infantry school in Camp Geiger, North Carolina. We spent all our days and nights learning how to take the fight to our enemies, shooting, tactics, hand-to-hand -hand combat, maneuvers. It was exactly what I thought being a Marine was going to be like. We were constantly told to stay vigilant in our training uh, because at that time we were pretty certain that we were going to have to go to war in the near future. I had this one instructor in particular uh, that I really looked up to. His name was Sergeant Miles, Sean Miles. He was exactly what most people would think about and picture in their head when they thought about a Marine. He was loud, he was tough as nails. He exuded the Marine Corps values, and throughout my eight years in the Marine Corps, I constantly looked back to Sergeant Miles uh, to help guide my path. So after infantry school, I joined my unit in June of 2002, and from the very day that I walked into my unit, uh, we knew that we were gearing up for war. The strange part was, when I got there, that even though I was an 0311, which is the Marine Corps designation for an infantry rifleman, I found out that I wasn't going to be doing that job very often 
uh, during the first part of the war. The Marine Corps, as Mr. Marcello had explained to you guys, that they had chosen me and 30 other Marines in that unit, all infantry Marines, uh, to start up the Marine Corps Mortuary, Affair Pro Mortuary Affairs Program. And uh, it's definitely not what I thought I was going to be doing with my career. But as we do, we adapt. And uh, we ended up doing that job for my full two deployments. Um, our job was to collect the bodies off the battlefield. And it was the first time mortuary affairs had been involved in a war. Uh, certain Marines had gone, the guys who started the, the program up, they were in the Gulf War. And they got the beginning part of the training and brought it to us, and we stood up the entire program. Um, so as, I, as soon as I got to my unit, we, we started training and started learning the job, writing SOPs to write the laws that would create the job. And within six months, I got my orders that we were going to Iraq. We landed in Kuwait in February of 2003 and continued training there for the 30 days up until we got word that we were going to war. On March 19th, 2003, myself, along with thousands of other Marines, are huddled in tents right at the Iraq-Kuwait border, listening to small little radios as President Bush declared war on Iraq. Within 24 hours of that moment, we all loaded up in our trucks. We listened to the great General Mattis give a speech right at the border, and we started pushing through and heading into Baghdad. I was only 19 years old and barely out of high school, and I was already headed to war. From the second we crossed the border, it was chaos. Near constant firefights, ambushes, we didn't sleep for more than two, two hours for three days. It took about 30 days to reach Baghdad with no showers, no sleep hardly. Our supply lines were constantly getting ambushed, so we, were, we had to ration food and water. It might sound crazy to all of you, but after the initial shock and fear of what was taking place, it was honestly the most fun I've ever had in my life. After the invasion of Iraq, I volunteered for a second deployment. And since I knew that my new wife would kill me for volunteer to go back to war and leaving her at home alone with our one-year-old son, I did what any smart man would have done. I lied. I told her that the rest of my, I told her and the rest of my family that our unit was being ordered to go back, which about 90% of our unit volunteered and to go back on the second deployment, and my conscience just wouldn't let me let them go without me to fight. So I got to Fallujah in August of 2005, just in time for my 21st birthday, exactly where every 21-year-old wants to be. This time, we weren't living on the back of a truck for months at a time. We were in a large base, living in a trailer. We had showers and a chow hall, and we only went off a base when we needed to. Most of the time, the remains, the bodies of those who fell, were brought to us. And it was only when it was too dangerous for them to be brought to us that we would have to go out and grab them ourselves. My first time going off a base on that deployment was when three Marines were killed in an IED explosion. We got there, and the hole from the IED was about eight feet deep and about 20 feet across. The Humvee that they were riding in was in pieces, most of which you could pick up in your hands. That following December, we got a call that we were getting in an unknown number of Marines who were killed by another IED. That total ended up being 10 Marines killed, 11 wounded. Myself and my team spent over eight hours processing the remains of those warriors before loading them into a plane and sending them back home to their family. Shortly after that, around January, I found out that my former infantry school instructor that I spoke about already, Sean Miles, the man that I, that I modeled my career after, was also in Fallujah. I spent about three days trying to track him down. 
but with the constant flow of missions that his unit was performing, I never got the chance. On that fourth day, I finally saw him. His body was brought into my collection point and had been killed by a sniper. I was, uh, I was coming to the, he was coming to the aid of one of his fellow Marines who had been wounded when he was killed. Since coming home from Fallujah, I've gotten in contact with Sergeant Miles' family, and over the past 12 years or more, I've been able to keep contact with them. I've been able to watch his son grow up, who is now about your guys' age. He's now in ROTC, plays football for the same high school his dad played football in. And uh, his dad would be very proud of him. So I'm, I'm kind of lucky. I got to do, for eight years, what I love doing more than anything in the world. I love being a Marine. I loved serving my country, and I would do it all again right now if I could. Thanks. Thank you, Randy. Your country thanks you. Robert Philpott. Most of you probably don't know Robert Philpott. He's our head custodian in the second shift, on the second shift. I've known Robert for quite a long time because I taught both of his daughters at Garfield. Robert was always an interesting guy to talk to. He always is an interesting guy to talk to. He's got a world of experience. And if you're here after school sometime and see him, say hello. Robert was in the United States Navy from 1988 to 1998. The most interesting conflict he served in was Operation Restore Hope from 1992 to May of 1993. His unit, a naval construction battalion, was deployed to the African country of Somalia to repair and build supporting facilities for the United Nations Task Force. In conversations with Mr. Philpott, he often says it's very important for students like yourselves to recognize our staff members who are also veterans, like Mr. Phillips and Ms. Newman. Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Robert Philpott. Good afternoon. Um, I don't know if all, any of you know me, but I've seen many of you around. Uh, a lot of kids keep track of. I really like working here. I like working with the students. Um, so I just want to give you a couple of stories that when I was in, I was in for 10 years. I went in the Navy uh, in 1988. I also graduated in 1988. I went in right after high school. Um, when I went in, uh, went to boot camp and I got on a plane. And I just left and left, you know, Hamilton, Ohio, and uh, I kind of didn't look back for a while. When I graduated from boot camp, I went into nuclear field A school. Uh, that lasted uh, about six weeks. It's supposed to last much longer than that, but I kind of got my my career together and went to the an aircraft carrier, the USS Forrestal. It's, uh, it was one of the uh, planes that John McCain actually was involved in. It was a big fire. To, still to this day, it serves as a training video. Uh, if you can look it up on Wikipedia, you can find a lot of information about it. Um, I was on the forest all for a year, nine months, and five days. After that, I left and went to Gulfport, Mississippi for construction A school. And in the Navy, I did surveying, drafting, and soils testing, something you don't typically uh, associate with the, with the Navy. But I was in the construction battalion. That's what I did. I was one of 300 people at any given time that did that. One of the things I did, um, as Mr. Marcello mentioned, was go to uh, Somalia. It's a uh, country in Africa. 
I didn't really know much about it at the time. I actually got the call. I was on leave. I got the call. I was here in Ohio, and I had to come back early. They wouldn't tell me why, but given what was going on in the news, I knew why. <clears throat> That's when I knew I was going to get called up to go into conflict. Wouldn't exactly call it a war, but it was certainly a conflict. And it was one of the times that the United States was called in to help, help the world. As you see in history, we're always called in. The United States, whether it's World War II, World War I, Vietnam, that's what the United States does. And it makes me proud to have served in the military, to be able to do that and be a part of that. It, makes, it also makes me proud to be an American. When I got to Somalia, one of the things that happened, one of the first things, we got off the plane, and for the first time, I was handed bullets. And that first time, it really meant something to me. I was handed, I shot rifles in, in, in the range and, and did my testing before and training exercises, and stuff like that. It's really no big deal. But when they handed that to me, when I was standing there, I kind of got this eerie feeling, I might actually have to use this. I was hoping I didn't, and I never did have to. But I had that feeling, you know, like this is, this is real. When I got there, I looked around the country, and I noticed that it was, you know, much different as you would expect in, in a country like Somalia, but it at one time was a, was a civilized nation. But I got there, and all the power lines were gone. All the doors and windows were taken out of the buildings. Everything was, was, was sold to other countries to make money. The, the society had collapsed. And one of the things that was going on is the, some of the uh, tribes there were making it hard for the United Nations to feed the kids. And these people were starving over there. And the United Nations was getting, their operation was getting robbed. And um, so they needed the military to come in. And that's one of the things we did. We went in, the Marines actually went in and secured the base. Approximately one week later is when I landed in Somalia and we did the construction projects to support the other forces. And one of the things that really kind of brought it home to me what it meant to be an American was we were out on a patrol at the, at the seaport and bringing in equipment and I was coming back and, I, and coming back, to, everything was staged at the airport. And when I was coming back, uh, the, there was a lot of different countries there that had been involved in this mission. But when I was coming back, I saw all these flags, different countries, didn't really know what they were. But when I saw the red, white, and blue, the stars and stripes, that's when I knew I was proud to be American. It, and, and that's when it really sunk into me that, you know, I'm. I'm glad I'm an American, you know, uh, soldier in this conflict, and I was very proud at that moment, proud to be an American, proud to serve. I was also proud to help the world to do some good. So it was kind of a, kind of a rough place. That's one place where I learned to appreciate most everything in life. Um, I remember washing my clothes in a, in a, in a garbage can. Thankfully, it was a, a new garbage can. And, you know, you just kind of take your clean clothes for granted. And, and at that point, when I was hanging them up on a, on a tent line and washing my clothes, and finally we got washing machines in. We brought them all in. And, and I just sort of appreciated that. If, if you ever, um, in certain situations, you learn to appreciate things. And I also learned to appreciate you know, our, just our country and how civilized we are and how important it is for all of us to get along. So, um, but one of the things that, that helped me get through that situation, because when you're in these situations, you're kind of like, you're seeing really bad things. Country in despair, people starving. One of the things that they did get me through it was the fact that I knew at some point in time I would get on a plane leave and, and go away from that. So that helped me get through that. Um, after Somalia came back, um, went back to Spain, 
And then uh, we're there about three months. I came back, that was my last overseas deployment. Um, I was back a few months, I forget the timeline, it's been a while. Um, then I transferred to Pensacola, Florida, and uh, that's where I met my wife. Actually, she was in Gulfport where I left, but I, I was coming back to visit. And uh, a few later, years later, I had my two daughters that Mr. Marcello was telling you about, that he taught them. And uh, then in 1998, I got out of the military, and I was, um, did a few things, uh, worked in the security industry, a couple other things. In 2010, I actually uh, started working for the school district and uh, been here ever since. And I got about another 20 years to go and then that'll be it. So, thank you. You may have figured it out, maybe not, but when you put a program together like this, you kind of want to make it a family affair. And when I say family affair, I'm talking about the Hamilton family, that every one of our speakers has some connection directly or indirectly with the district. Our final speaker today fits that bill because his daughter, Donna, is a science teacher and has been a science teacher at Wilson for a very long time. Now, I don't know if many of you had her because she, I think, what did you say, Donna, taught eighth grade, then seventh grade, and so, yeah, so she teaches seventh grade now there, but her dad, Don, I know very well. I go to church with him, and I make it a point every Saturday to go up to his pew, usually sits towards the front, and I just talk with him, ask him how he is, check in on him, as a sign of respect. Because this is a man who's earned it. Don was born and raised here in Hamilton, and he enlisted in the Army at the age of 18 and spent eight weeks in Breckenridge, Kentucky for basic. He came home for 30 days and then went to Seattle, Washington, bound for Japan. According to Don, the water was so rough, it took from December 24th to January 8th to get there. He was then assigned to the 1st Cavalry Division. After that regiment was dissolved, he was sent to northern Japan to the 32nd Infantry and was active in training there for about a year and a half before the Korean War broke out in 1950, part of the Cold War, which we'll be studying here this year. He then went back to southern Japan for the trip to Korea. Don said it took him 11 days to get to Korea aboard a landing ship tank. He said it went only 11 miles an hour across the Yellow Sea to Incheon, Korea. Don said he knew it was no game when all the men were issued live ammunition before they landed in Korea. As I said, Don is the father of Donna Davis, a science teacher at Wilson, and Don turns a young 90 years old this month. Don Reed. First of all, I would like to look around this crowd. You are our future leaders for this great country of ours. And I get sentimental. Well, when I see young people like you, that what a future you can make for yourself. Now is where you're learning to do it. So I'll head right into Korea. Uh, like uh, Mr. Chris said, that I spent a year and a half in Japan before Korea broke out. And when it, uh, uh, is it working? Yeah, it just was a little quiet. There you go. That'll be better. Uh, I went from uh, Japan when Korea broke out well, on an LST. 
that was that ship that the front end opened up and landed on the, the banks. So we went in the first day there. We didn't reach too much resistance because MacArthur planned this out. He had a hard time getting it through Washington, D.C. to go in at Inchon because Inchon had a three mile tide change. In other words, every 12 hours the sea went out and it was mud. So the landing craft would be stuck in the mud. So uh, we, the first day we didn't run into much of this uh, resistance at all. Second day we caught some mortar fire. Some guys got hit. Third day we got a bonsai. The Koreans, when they came at you, they hollered bonsai, bonsai, and they uh, had sirens, and whistles, bugles blowing at you until they, well, until they quit, I guess. Anyhow, uh, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, the, the Koreans, were, were fierce fighters. And uh, I, I thought the map would, I got a map here that, that uh, well, I'm not gonna be able to show you. Oh, here it is. I was stationed, this is the Sea of Japan. Japan was a hundred and some odd miles from here over, I think 160 miles from here to Japan. Well, on well, the LSTs, we came around this way and went into Incheon. Uh, I, I can't, let's see, where's the 38th parallel at? Uh, in other words, <laughs> this one I was here last year, and the, this is kind of blurry, it was blurry last year too. So, uh, but anyhow, we went around and made it, well, Incheon down in here. And this is the 38th parallel. This was the difference between North Korea and South Korea. So we went in here. The third day, we got a bonsai hit us. And we lost seven men. We killed 132. We counted the next morning, 132. Uh, well, I call them gooks. Everybody else call them gooks. But I understand that's not political right nowadays to call them gooks, so I'll say North Koreans. We killed 132 of them. And that next day, the government issued lime for us to cover up all the bodies that were laying around us. They were up in our position. So we kept on going up here. We kept on going. And there, there, you heard of the... Uh, Chosin Reservoir, this is where the Chosin Reservoir was. Over 300,000 Chinese came in all at one time. It was in November sometime. And they, I was here at this here, but the military sent me up here, right in this area up here. This is Manchuria, this was Russia. And so, we got, didn't get hit with the onslaught of the 300,000 men, but we caught a lot of flack from there. So the Chinese came in through this way down to the Chosen Reservoir, and the, uh, I was in the 32nd Infantry Regiment, and so we had to retreat, and we went, they pulled us back to Ham Hung down here, it was a seaport, and we walked most of the way back here. But in three days we caught on a ship here and went way back down here to Pusan. Now when the Koreans first came in the war, they pushed the whole rigmarole, the, all the U.S. Army down to this perimeter down here on Pusan. This was where they stood. And uh, we had a General Dean came over to Japan and he says, we're going over there to Korea for one reason, to kill gooks. 
And I tell you, I had a year and a half training on a mortar fire. I was a uh, forward observer, the director of the mortar fire on the enemy. And so we took off again and we got up somewhere in the mountains here. We were a guerrilla fighting unit. We fought mostly in the mountains and on uh, other uh, North Grands as it was in the mountains and jumped us. And I got hit someplace up in, or in these mountains here. And uh, maybe, maybe you guys uh, seen pictures of these early helicopters. They just had a plastic bubble over the front. Well, they started bringing them in Korea, and the medics, God bless them, they, uh, they carried me off the top of the mountain down to the helicopter. And these helicopters was, had a mummy cage, you know what a mummy cage is, on each side, of, they didn't have any wheels on them, they just had steel support squad to land with. And that's the mummy cage out there. And they flew me back to a, a mash unit, which was a surgical unit. And uh, I was afraid of a sniper going through that mummy cage and getting me more so than anything else. The mummy cage, you just had a glass over your face. And it had come up a terrible, terrible storm before we got back to the mash unit. And uh, we finally got there we're six, about 60 miles on the helicopter to get back to this mash unit. It, I guess all of you know what a mash unit was, is because you've seen it on television. The mash. How many of you here have seen mash on television? Yeah, okay. Well, I tell you what, the medics carried me off that mountain and I was hit in the chest, in the leg, in my right bicep, uh, caught it too. And uh, I said, let me walk. And they said, no, you don't walk, you don't walk. And them guys carried me over some of the roughest terrain you ever would want to get in. And, uh, I have the greatest admiration for the medics. They were just fine people. So they went to the, went through the surgical unit back someplace where the helicopter dropped us off. And they had a, a like a school bus, was, was, had stretchers in it. Yeah, and from the helicopter, they took me into a surgery. It was a tent, uh, like you see it on MASH. And, uh, uh, it had white linens hanging down from it. I can remember seeing them. Well, they put me out, and the next thing I woke up, well, I was on a, I didn't know where I was exactly, but I was on an airplane, a C-47 with stretchers. They took me back to Japan. To, for, I had already had my original surgery, but I was there in the hospital in Japan for three months and before I came out. Uh, and then I had to go all the way back to Japan to get rotated back to the States. So I uh, come back to Japan and caught a C4, uh, no, it was a four engine motor plane to, to come back to the States. So I came back to the States and uh, I uh, was, had to go down to Fort Knox, Kentucky to report back there. And so I did, and they assigned me to Aberdeen, Maryland. And I was assigned to a, a maneuver area, and I was in charge of the maneuver area. Boy, did I have it made. I had a Jeep, I had a three quarter ton truck, I had a two and a half ton truck, and a corporal to drive me around. <laughs> the, the area, uh, Elk Neck State Park, was about 30 miles upside of, uh, of Aberdeen Camp. It's bigger than Houston Woods. I mean, how many of you have been up to Houston Woods? Okay. It was bigger than that up there the park was. So, uh, but I really had it made up there. So I stayed. Uh, Tr President Truman froze discharges. You couldn't get a discharge. 
And I spent 11 months up in Aberdeen, Maryland, and uh, the, the uh, uh, President Truman released discharges, and uh, I, uh, he, he, he told me that I had a captain who was over me, and he says, uh, read he says, I want you to re-up for six months. He said, I'll make you a warrant officer. And uh, so I thought, hmm, they're, back in Korea, they're neating sergeants back there. So that's probably how I would have wound up. I said, Captain, I'm going home. He says, uh, what are you going to do when you get home? I said, I'm going home. I lived on a farm on a Kyle Station Road out for out four. And my dad raised pigs, hogs. I said, I'm going to raise hogs. He said, I won't tell you the word he used to say. <laughs> You're not going to raise the hogs. But anyhow, uh, I left the Army. So, but uh, a lot of stuff in Korea. Has anybody got any questions about Korea? Uh, let me refresh it. We got enough time? OK. Uh, that map again? That map again? OK. OK. There's a lot of towns in here, but Ham Hung was a town that they was, I tell you what, I hadn't had a bath in about a month, I guess. And the ships had good warm hot water over the shower. Boy, I said, I didn't stay here forever. So, uh, but the ships took us back down to here. And there's a lot of, lot of things that that for lack of time, uh, I, I went over. Uh, if you bear with me in a second, Chris, we've got to, okay. Uh, let me see my notes from, oh yeah. Uh, maybe I covered this before, I don't know. General Douglas MacArthur. How many have you ever heard of General Douglas MacArthur in general? Oh, wonderful, a few of you did. He was a great strategist. He believed in peer, uh, spearheading uh, against the enemy. In other words, he would spearhead and he'd get a, a head and, and he would send up troops to mop up the enemy in the rear of you. And uh, he, he had a hard time, like I said, a hard time getting uh, an inch on the land because the, the North Koreans uh, didn't suspect that we would land there because it was, it, the tide was so great. And uh, so uh, he, 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 when he, we all landed there, he, uh, he was very successful in that. Well, General MacArthur was a guy he didn't take no for an answer, and he did what he wanted to do. So he, he, he didn't agree with President Truman too much. So President Truman went to Korea to see him and talk to him. They went to another island. And uh, so he didn't say anything to him in general about dismissal, but he went back to Washington, D.C and he dismissed General MacArthur. Uh, if you ever get down to uh, the shipyard, I can't think of the name of the city it's in, he and his wife were both buried there at the shipyard. You, you know the big naval base uh, down in, oh, shucks, I can't think of it. Norfolk. Norfolk. Norfolk, Norfolk Virginia. Uh, but he and his wife were buried down there. And I, I thought a lot of General MacArthur. He was, uh, he was for the men, except the temperature up in North Korea was 35 below zero. And we had a field check on the right. <laughs> One night, uh, it got so cold that the, well, I'm going to use gooks again. They lit fires on their mountain, and we lit fires on our mountain. And it was below 35, below zero. So uh, 
But, you, but I was 19 years old then, so uh, I was in pretty good shape because we trained every day, six days a week. And the outfit I was with, we were the best mortar section in the division. So when we was in Japan, we had a field day. All the generals and the, all the high ranking officers was there to see us perform on this mortar, mortar round. Well, me being from farm, I had a pretty good idea of, on the outside life of, in uh, estimating uh, distances. And as a matter of fact, I had to go out to get the cows. I'd start throwing rocks at them to get them. Some, I had a couple of cows that would hide on us. And uh, uh, I would pick a handful of rocks and start, I started hitting cows from a pretty good distance. So Dad says, you better quit that. So uh, anyhow, to get back to my story on the field day, uh, we were the best unit in the division. And uh, we had a lieutenant, Lieutenant Stanley Atkins. I swear to land, I'll never go to the state of Iowa because he lives, lived there. I don't know if he's still alive or not, but he was one of these kind of guys that you called all kinds of names. But he trained us to the point where we were the best. So uh, anybody got any questions? No? No questions? Yeah? serve your country back in North Korea? Was it, how, how proud were you to serve your country? Well, I was 19, 20 years old, and I was more gung-ho than I was proud. <laughs> I, 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 I wasn't, uh, for some reason, I was not uh, scared. The only time I was really afraid is when the mortar rounds come in or artillery come in on us, because you could hear them whistling through the air. You knew that they were going to land near you, but you didn't know how close. And the second time I was scared, when we was coming over on a troop transport from the United States to Japan early, uh, the sea was 30 feet above the, the bow of the ship. And there was a merchant marine. He and an another fellow, he told us to take some garbage back to the fantail. Back to the fantail and dump overboard. And uh, we being young punks, we went to the first hatch of the ship. To, well, one of them waves that broke over the top bow of the ship. And my buddy was with me. He grabbed me by the neck and nap of the neck or else I wouldn't be here today. It would have washed me overboard. And so there's a lot of things I have to be thankful for. I come home and for two years, I was having a good time, met a lot of girls. Until one day we was in a square dance and this girl kept, I get sentimental about that. She kept squeezing my hand and I was going to square dance around her. Um, I better look into this while well, I married her. That's the best move I made. Sixty years. We married her. I lost her five years ago. But she, she, she was a beauty. And I have five, six children. One of them passed when he was age twelve. And my daughter not over here. All my children were successful. So I have a lot to be thankful for. That's all I have for Christmas. Thank you, Don. Now we're not done. We're not done yet with Don. 
We're not done yet with Don. Don might think we're done with Don, but we're not done with Don. As I said earlier in the introduction, Don's got a special birthday this month. I think Don, did you say it was the 25th? 25th of November, Don is gonna be 90 years young. And we could only hope that we look and feel and act as well as he does when we're 90 years old. So we decided that our school would honor him with a small token of, a, of our appreciation. It would really be great if everyone could stand up and we could sing happy birthday together. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Don. Happy birthday to you. Please be seated. Just a few, few remarks. Thank you so much, students, for your attention to our heroes that were here today. I'd like to close with some words of one of our former presidents. He said, on Veterans Day, we acknowledge humbly that we can never serve our veterans in quite the same way that they served us. But we can try. We can practice kindness. We can pay it forward. We can volunteer. We can serve. We can respect one another. We can always get each other's backs. That is what Veterans Day asks all of us to think about. The person you pass as you walk down the street might not be wearing our nation's uniform today, but consider for a moment that a year or a decade or a generation ago, he or she might have been one of our fellow citizens who was willing to lay down their lives for strangers like us. And we can show how much we love our country by loving our neighbor as ourselves. May God bless all who served and still do, and those who are with us today. And may God bless the United States of America. Thank you. You'll now be dismissed back to your eighth period class. Thank you and have a great evening. Hope you're hungry, Don. Oh, good.